Welcome back to AP Chemistry, General Chemistry. I'm Jeremy Krug, and in this video, we're going to be learning uh, more about spectrophotometry and how to solve some problems and carry out some chemical analyses using spectrophotometry. This is a continuation of the last video, so if you haven't seen that, you might want to watch that first to see how we do spectrophotometry. Well, let's do some problems here. Here we have a student who's given a solid sample containing some copper two ions. She dissolves the entire sample in enough pure water to make 100 milliliters of solution. She then measures the absorbance of the solution to be 0 0.50. Now here I have the calibration curve for that absorbance, or rather for this experiment. So the question is, determine the concentration of copper two ions in the solution. All you have to do is read the graph. So in this problem, it says that the absorbance was measured to be 0 0.50. Absorbance is normally a unitless uh, value, by the way. So we're just going to go over here to 0 0.50 and see, which is right here. And let's see where that ends up. So if I carry that across, I'm not very good at drawing a straight line on the screen, but as you can see, it seems to end up right around here. Whoops, right around here. So as you drop that down, what does the concentration look like? Well, it looks like it's right between 0.2 and 0.3. So I think it's pretty safe to say that the concentration of copper two ions is about 0.25 moles per liter. That's all you have to do. Once you have the calibration curve, just read the graph. Now, what if the question says, determine the number of moles of copper two ions in the original solid sample? Well, remember, if we have the concentration in moles per liter, and we have the volume of the solution, which is 0.1 liters, you know, 100 milliliters, all we have to do is multiply those two by each other to get moles, don't we? That's our shortcut to get moles, if you know both of those. So we just take the 0.25 molar times 0.1 liters, and we get the value of 0.025 moles of copper two ions. And so that's all you have to do. So spectrophotometry uh, makes our life uh, a lot easier if we're able to use that uh, to find the concentration of something. Here's another example with another calibration curve. A solid sample containing iron three ions is converted into 200 milliliters of a solution containing the dark red ion complex, uh, FESCN2+, which is the iron th th thiocyanate ion, and this iron thiocyanate has an absorbance measured at 453 nanometers, as shown in the graph below. So here we have the, the graph, which is our calibration curve. The question is, if the absorbance of the mixture is 0 0.30 at 453 nanometers, what is the concentration of the iron thiocyanate ions in the solution? Well, once again, we all we have to do is just read the graph. So 0.3 is right here. And so we just have to slide that over there on the line. And it's right here. So that seems to be a, a fairly easy place to read on the graph. We drop that down. And it seems to be we're at right at 6. So I'd say about 6.0 times 10 to the negative fifth moles per liter. So that's the concentration. That's all you have to do. Just read the graph. Now what if the question says how many moles of iron three were in the original solid sample. Well, remember, the iron three was converted on a one-to-one -one basis into the iron thiocyanate. And so we can use those values uh, interchangeably for all practical purposes. So if we have the, the volume 0.2 liters, you know, 200 milliliters is 0.2 liters, multiply that by the concentration of the iron three ions, well, we can get the answer. So just take those two, multiply them by each other, and we find that the number of moles is about 1.2 times 10 to the negative fifth moles of iron three ions. So that's all we have to do, just uh, carry out the analysis here. So the, the chemistry here is not that difficult. It's mostly review, 
The hard part here is being able to make that calibration curve and more often than not they actually give us that calibration curve and all we have to do is read the graph. Now let's try another example. Very often they'll ask these questions in a multiple choice format. And let's see what we have here. When using a spectrophotometer to measure the concentration of copper two ions in a sample, the calibration curve shown below is produced. So we have the curve, but it looks like there's something wrong with it, as you can see. Which of the following most likely caused the error in the point plotted at 0 0.08 molar copper two? So as we can see, it looks like this dot right here really should be somewhere around there, but somehow it got it got off the line. It, it, it's too low. So let's try to explain what caused the error. So choice A tells us or proposes to us that the sample was contaminated by some 0.1 molar copper two ion solution. Well, does that make sense? I don't think so, because if the sample had a little bit of 0.1 molar in it, then that means that what we thought was 0.08 actually had a higher concentration. And if it had a higher concentration, then its absorbance should be higher, not lower. So the dot, uh, if that were true, the dot would probably be up here somewhere. But you know that's not right. So A, I'm going to cross you out. You're gone. How about choice B? The student used a cuvette with a longer path length than the cuvette used for the other solutions. Now, in the last video, if you watched that, you hopefully saw that we normally don't change the path length. We normally use one centimeter cuvettes, but what if we had a different one? Well, hopefully we realize that according to Beer's law, A equals ABC. And if the value for B, which is the path length, goes up, what's going to happen to the absorbance? Well, it should go up as well, shouldn't it? So longer path length longer cuvette means higher absorbance. And is that what we have here? No. The absorbance is too low. So that's not the answer either. And now if the cuvette used a shorter cuvette then, or if the student used a, short, a smaller cuvette then maybe that would be the case. But that's not right either in this, in this uh, her choice B is certainly not right. So I'm crossing that one out. The student forgot to run a blank in the experiment. Is that what happened? No, because we can see right here that there's a blank. You know, we have a zero concentration and a zero absorbance, so that's not right either. It has to be D, right? And let's just read that to make sure it makes sense. There was distilled water in the cuvette when the student put the standard solution in it. I would say that is, is the best explanation because distilled water would, uh, of course, has a concentration of zero molar copper, and so if you put a little bit of zero into something that you think is 0 0.08, the value is going to be lower than you think it is. So yeah, that, that, that does make sense. So that's why the answer is D for this one. If you know Beer's Law, and you know how the experiment works, you should be able to uh, answer questions like this. Now, let's talk about a, a few details here with spectrophotometry. You might have noticed that in the examples that I gave you in this, uh, in this series of videos, we focused on compounds that had very distinct uh, colors like cobalt uh, ions and copper two ions. And we had a, a bright red iron thiocyanate in there too. Well, that's because these ions have actual visible colors that we can detect in our laboratory spectrophotometers. You know, spectrophotometers, if it's visible, they have a range that focuses on the visible light spectrum. So the visible light spectrum is what you're focused on. You know, most of these have a, a range that goes a little bit beyond that, but mainly we're focusing on the visible. Now, if you have more expensive equipment, you may be able to go a little bit beyond that. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. Here's the visible spectrum. It runs from about uh, somewhere a little bit short of 400 nanometers up to about 700. If you have a spectrophotometry photometer in your laboratory, you can take a look at it and see that it actually runs a little bit beyond that. Most of these go from about maybe 330, somewhere over here, to about 1,000. So that actually runs into the infrared. If you go up in price, you can actually go, uh, you can actually increase your range, maybe get all the way down to about 190 
nanometers and up a little bit higher than a thousand. So most of these laboratory spec, uh, spectrophotometers that you are most likely to use in your lab will go a little bit into infrared and ultraviolet, but not very far. So which ions have visible colors? Sometimes on the AP Chemistry exam, they expect you to know a few, not all, but a few of these ions. And so uh, here are the most common ions that actually have a visible color. Copper ions tend to be blue. If you've worked with copper 2 sulfate or other copper solutions, you probably know this already. Uh, nickel ions tend to be green, a very beautiful green color as it turns out. Iron ions tend to be yellow or orange depending on the concentration. And as it turns out, chromium ions tend to be that way too. They have this yellow or this orange color. And cobalt ions tend to have a pink color. So if you see pink, sometimes if it's very concentrated, it looks almost red. So those are some common colors that you really do need to be aware of for the AP Chemistry exam. Now, I've thrown a lot at you as far as uh, spectrophotometry and uh, chemical analysis in this series of videos in Lesson 21 here. How do you keep all this straight? Well, first of all, in the first video, we said gravimetric analysis is just a stoichiometry problem. So don't make it more complicated than it is. Just, you know, do your three-step process. Convert to moles, do the mole ratio, make sure you have a balanced equation, and then uh, convert to that final unit, which is probably going to be grams. Uh, when you have a spectrophotometry graph, just double check to make sure that the that the chemist has used a blank at point zero. That's probably a good thing. That In fact, it's always a good thing to do. To find concentration, just read the graph. Line up absorbance with concentration, and you'll uh, be able to, to uh, find the concentration pretty easily with that calibration curve. If you're ever asked to find the optimal wavelength, like we had in the last video, choose the maximum absorbance for the ion, and go for the one that has the least interference as well. That's what you're looking for. If you have a lower concentration, sometimes by contamination from water, like we said in the last multiple choice example there, those are gonna drop absorbance. Uh, if you have a higher concentration, that increases the absorbance. If you were ever to have a longer cuvette length, that's gonna raise absorbance. If you ever had a shorter cuvette length, that's going to lower absorbance. But of course, we try not to mess with the cuvette length much at all, to be completely honest. Well, I hope in this video and in this series of videos, you've learned something about spectrophotometry and, and how this works on the AP Chemistry exam. If you uh, learned something from my video or enjoyed it in the least bit, please uh, hit that thumbs up button if you'd be so kind as to do so. I'm Jeremy Krug. I've been teaching AP Chemistry for over 20 years, and I'm trying to, uh, to get uh, uh, as many people as possible to pass and make a five on this AP exam and make an A in their course. So join me again on our next lesson as we journey through chemistry, where we can learn some more chemistry together.